Good morning and welcome to the first part of a two-part series with Ed Duarte as a speaker, uh, Estimating and Bidding Part 1, The Basics. My name is James Forrest. I'm the Program Coordinator for NorCal PTAC. Our pres presenter today, like I said, is Ed Duarte. He is our Construction and Public Works Specialist, and you are in very good hands with him. I'm going to hand things over pretty quickly. First, I want to talk a little bit about our program. NorCal PTEC stands for Northern California Procurement Technical Assistance Center. It's a bit of a mouthful, so we do NorCal PTAC, much easier for everybody. Uh, we are hosted by the Humboldt State University Sponsored Programs Foundation. You can see on that map there, that's the red star way up in Humboldt County. Uh, we're funded by the Defense Logistics Agency, as well as state and local sources. And in 2020 alone, our clients won more than $314 million in government contracts. That's twice as much as in 2019, and we're on track to blow that number out of the water. Um, so if you are in our service area, you've come to the right place for help getting your foot in the door with contracts. Um, how do we help our clients? So three basic ways. The first is one-on-one -on -one counseling. We can, if you put in an application, if you are located, if your business has a main location located in one of these counties in green. So we get a lot of folks, like, like I said, you, you, some folks were from Dallas, um, Fairbanks, Alaska, all over the place, even Irvine, which is in California. Um, there's PTAX across the country. You could apply for those. This is for us. You're welcome to join all webinars, no matter where you're from. Use all our resources on our website. Uh, but for client services, it's for um, the folks located in this service area specifically. And this is what we can do. We can do one-on-one -on -one counseling. So if you apply on our website, we'll connect you with a procurement specialist. They can walk you through just about any topic related to government contracting under the sun. Um, we don't do grant applications or financing, but pretty much everything else related to government contracting, um, certifications, getting your, um, doing marketplace research, bid proposals, all sorts of things. Uh, and if you are a client, we can also set you up with a custom bid matching profile. This thing is pretty neat. What it does is it, is it gathers and aggregates all of the bids that match the criteria that you work out with your procurement specialist, then it sends them right to your inbox every morning. So it helps you stay on top of, of those opportunities. And then the third thing, because um, you all know, because you're here today, we, can, we do resources and trainings on a regular basis. And as I mentioned, these are free always free and always free to join from wherever uh, we get folks from other countries sometimes. So, well, we're happy to have you here and you can keep coming to these for as long as we exist. Uh, and so the long and the short of it is if you wanna be a PTAC client, check to make sure your business is located in one of these 15 counties here. And then you can go to our website, norcalptac.org, click on the red apply now button to get started, submit an application. I'll be reviewing your application and we'll sign you to a procurement specialist if you're eligible. Do also make sure that your business is set up and ready to go. So any licenses you need, um, ready to do sales. Uh, don't, don't be a pre-venture business. If you need help with that, I would suggest getting in contact with the Small Business Development Center, SBDC. And we can do a referral, but it's really easiest to just type in SBDC than your county. Uh, so, and just another note, as I mentioned, there's PTAX across the whole country. I believe there's 94 of them right now but they're all over the place. So if you're not in our service area and you're starting to get stressed out that you're not in our service area, don't worry, they're all over the place. So there's PTAX in Texas, you name it, PTAX in Southern California. Um, so that second link on there uh, will have, uh, that's how you find your local PTAC. By the way, as I mentioned, these slides will be sent out to everybody. The slides will be clickable. So you can click through these links later. You don't need to worry about that. We always get plenty of questions about slides and video. Another note that we are recording this session and the recording as well as the slides that we sent. Uh, also be posted to our website where you can find all of our past webinars and all the information. We're also gonna have some goodies. We're gonna have an Excel spreadsheet and some PDFs. I believe those will also be recorded in the resources afterwards. So uh, that's my spiel. Thanks for joining everyone. Let's go ahead and get started with Ed Duarte, who again is our construction and public works specialist. Thanks, Ed, go ahead and take it away. Thank you, James. Good morning, everybody. Um, so pleasantly surprised to see so many people from all different walks of life and uh, from such a wide geographical area. 
I'll be your host this morning. I'm going to be putting on a workshop on the basics of construction estimating for public works. Uh, my background is um, civil engineering and general contracting. The family has a business that's been doing this for over 50 years. I retired about five or six years ago. I don't claim to have all the answers, but when you've been in the business as long as I have, uh, there aren't too many scenarios that I have not encountered during my career. So what I'll be presenting today is a reflection of the business practices that our firm has provided uh, in the California public works construction market. Next slide, please. It's our standard disclosure. What we want to talk about today is the overview of Caltrans and other similar public agency specifications and their requirement for bidding and to try to understand the bid and price pricing process and the typical bid format. As James mentioned, I will be going through uh, about a dozen uh, other slides, PDF uh, attachments to illustrate the types of documents that you will be uh, involved with. Next slide. There's essentially uh, six different types of, of um, bid proposals that are utilized in the construction industry. I'm gonna be talking about two of them, uh, the lump sum method and the unit price format. The unit price format is the one I'm gonna to emphasize today and the lump sum approach will be talked about day after tomorrow on Thursday for our second session. Um, on the unit price format, which is uh, what it, uh, I say typical Caltrans, but it's really typical public agency for heavy civil projects. If you're doing a, a Caltrans highway, a county road, uh, a, um, any type of uh, what we call heavy civil construction, those types of projects are, the plans and specs are prepared by civil engineers and they utilize what they call a, 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 a unit price bid format with a multitude of bid items, which put a little bit a different type of requirement on contractors and when you uh, prepare your bid proposal. Next slide. Obviously, uh, the uh, preliminary bidding and estimating considerations include the invitation to bid and pre-bid notification and the bid walk. And I always, I always emphasize that when all at all possible, please attend any pre-bid job walks that the owner might conduct. Now, we all know that with the COVID in the past 18 months, uh, bid walks were relegated to either being eliminated or uh, virtual, which is uh, cumbersome and clumsy at best, but it was uh, something that the industry had to deal with. As we emerge from COVID, uh, bid walks are coming back. And if your bidding is a prime, uh, you absolutely must be attending these bid walks. And on the larger projects for the subcontracts are major, like in the mechanical electrical trades, uh, you're, you need to attend that bid walk as well. So the overview covers uh, estimating labor and equipment costs, estimating materials and subcontractor costs, job site overhead, and then a recap of all those costs, uh, <clears throat> putting in a contingency and doing your final markup for profit. Next. Obviously, we need a project description by the owner, engineer, or architect, which it describes the scope of work. We need plans and specs. Um, most of them have uh, uh, material and equipment schedules and materials lists. Uh, there will be bonding and insurance requirements. There'll be submittal requirements. And there will be, a, obviously, in California, there will be a ton of applicable 
government requirements or regulatory impact. All of these affect how you set up your spreadsheet and how you prepare your estimate. Next, please. Excuse me. <clears throat> so unless you're buying estimating software, and um, I'm gonna take a moment to do a sidebar here. When I started doing these workshops over 20 years ago, Excel was essentially the basic format that every contractor would use. I think you'll find today that most general contractors and, and a lot of subcontractors are still using Excel. We use it at our company, but there has been a growth obviously due to the uh, technology of, uh, of the internet and software that there's uh, estimating programs out on the market. And depending on the cost and the complexity, are they user-friendly? Uh, a lot of subcontractors are going to that. A lot of general contractors are going to that, but the majority of us still like to use Excel for the simple reason that we can customize the spreadsheet template to match our company's way of doing business, the way we estimate a project. So using that format, you follow the CSI master format to set up your spreadsheet because you're only gonna cover five basic costs, labor, which would be your in-house or self-performed labor, tools and equipment, materials, again, materials that you are going to purchase as a prime or that you're gonna purchase if you're the sub, subcontractor cost if you are the prime, and job site overhead. And I'll, I'll expand on job site overhead. Next. A good estimator sets up the spreadsheet it is essentially becomes a to-do list. Every line item should be a description of a task entry. In other words, you should be listing, what do I have to do to build this project? Everything from mobilization down to uh, final inspections and, and, and uh, setting up the warranty. There, there are, there's just an endless list of what needs to be done for any project. Well, I shouldn't say endless. It has to be finite if you're gonna put a value to it. So in, if you set up your spreadsheet as a to-do list, you're not gonna miss anything. Uh, the things that you can't cover are gonna be the what ifs, the contingency, which again, I'll talk about that. And the sample spreadsheet that I'm gonna show you a little later gives the column headings that address all of the cost factors for those work categories. <clears throat> Everybody likes to do their estimating a little different. Subcontractors do it differently than generals and generals do it differently depending on what construction company you're talking to. The way we like to do it is that we, in, in, and we enter every cost item as a direct cost, a full cost, but direct. In other words, without markup. And then we do a roll up at the very end. And that's when we add on our profit overhead and bond costs. And we'll talk about that next. So, <clears throat> In the, looking at the bottom first, the lump sum, you simply set your spreadsheet to address all the items, roll it all up, subtotal, mark it up, and submit one lump sum price. The typical methodology used for um, B license, general contractor building, uh, a building contractor for buildings. If you're gonna build a school building, you're gonna build a fire station, police station, community center, typically those owners are gonna ask for one lump sum price and maybe a few separate 
uh, sub prices for uh, uh, either an addendum or an alternate. The other one at the top, the unit price method, this is what people like, I mean, agencies like Caltrans, your county road offices, uh, BART, Bay Area Rapid Transit, they will have a list of bid items and they will have estimated quantities with defined units, square foot, lineal foot, cubic yard, square yard, et cetera. And that bid proposal will have that, 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 that an estimated quantity, except where the engineer is not comfortable in doing it. And then they'll simply say lump sum, uh, a quantity of one because it's a lump sum. That's the one we're gonna talk about today. Next. Let me stop there for a moment and let's, uh, are there any questions? And again, we'll go to the Q and A. Uh, I don't see any questions here, but just to let folks know that you can enter your questions into the Q and A tab. In this version of Zoom, there's a chat and a Q and A. I don't think I went over that. Um, let's just put it in the chat now. Um, chat, you can, you can um, ask all sorts of uh, networking style questions. If you want a question read aloud to Ed, put it in the Q&A and we'll get to it during Q&A breaks. Um, but I don't see anything now, so let's go ahead and head forward to the documents and then we'll look for some Q&A questions later. Sound good? Okay, let's go on to the next slide. You don't want to do the documents right now? Handouts? Yeah, yeah, let's do that. Okay. Okay, the first PDF I've got up here is um, a sample bid proposal form. This happens to be from a Caltrans uh, spe uh, specification book. So you can see when I, when, I, when I said unit item, unit pricing, they have contractor mobilization, staking, traffic control, et cetera, there's your LS, your lump sum, uh, remove concrete curb and gutter, 900 lineal feet, uh, remove the concrete sidewalk, 5,800 square feet, and so forth. If you go down through all of those, this particular job ends with item number 904, benches, uh, of which there is a quantity of eight each. What the general contractor on this proposal will need to do is fill in the unit cost. Let's go over to um, trash. Let's go to trash receptacle, and there's five of them. And this general contractor will probably get a price from a supplier, and they'll have. And the, the contractor will need to add in tax and freight, and then mark it up. And let's say they're a hundred dollar item. And they want to mark it up 15%. So that's $115. And the $100 includes taxes and freight. So at $115, they would enter that in the unit cost, multiply it times five, and the extension would be $575. That would be the cost of bid item 903, trash receptacle. That's the process that every prime contractor would have to go through for every single item. So you might ask, well, what happens if a bid item happens to be a 100% subcontractor item? Exactly. You simply enter the subcontractor's price, which should have already include tax, freight, and subcontractor markup. And then the prime would take that price and since I don't use subcontractor pricing unless I mark it up, I'm gonna add my markup to it. And then I'll, it's the same process, identical. When we get to the Excel spreadsheet, I'll show you how that all fits together. This is your basic process for bidding on a heavy civil project. As I said, this particular example happens to be a, um, a Caltrans sample project. Here's another example, a little more modern example. Again, the same process. 
And if you um, take a look at these bid items, this one doesn't have the roll up page. It doesn't have the bid proposal form, but it ends on bid item number 50, mobilization. So Caltrans wants a unit price for everything. Now, let me take another sidebar here and let's let's go to an item that has, um, let's take a look at item 15, fiber reinforced matrix. And they have an estimated quantity of 3,400 square feet. So I, I wanna make a comment that is important. And, and those of you who, uh, who are bidding as a prime or a sub, any contractor, when you bid on a project like this that has estimated quantity, they're, ca they're called that for a very good reason. The engineer went to the drawings and took off that quantity. They calculated the square footage of the reinforced matrix. And they came up with 3,400 square feet. The first question that you should be asking is, how accurate is it? Secondly, do they have waste accounted for? Because you can't buy exactly 3,400 square feet of that material and expect that when you lay it all down, you've used up every square foot. Any experienced contractor knows that. Same thing applies to a concrete contractor. When you order the ready mix for four, you don't, you don't order exactly what is calculated. You have to allow for waste. So my point here is that when you're bidding on these jobs and you look at these estimated quantities, do your own independent material takeoff. That number may be very accurate. It could be off by 25%. You don't know. You need to check it. Don't take the engineer's estimated quantity as gospel. So I hope I made that point. It's very important. In every project, there's what we call the information and the general conditions, which again have to be uh, uh, accounted for in your spreadsheet. Well, the, the top half dozen, they're the typical, again, the invitation to bid, which gives you the date, the time, and the place, the bonding requirements, the bid bond, the performance, and the payment bonds, which incidentally, those of you who are experienced, you already know this, only apply if you are bidding as a prime, all right? If you're gonna bid a job in California for a public works agency, a school district, a water district, a Caltrans, the county, cemetery district, BART, any of those, any public works agency in California, they will require a bond all of these bonds for the prime contractor. And then I'll talk a little later. We, they will, uh, the prime contractor is going to probably ask for performance of payment bonds from subcontractors, depending on the size of their subcontract price. We hear a lot of workshops where people I think are misled by saying, you have to learn how to do the bid proposal. Well, you don't have to learn a thing if you're bidding as a prime because we have absolutely no input on the bid proposal form. If you can read and follow directions, you can fill out a bid proposal form for any project. It's just a question of how big the project is. Again, this applies to the prime. The prime has no input as to how that proposal looks. So you, they even, most of the agencies now even include a checklist in the specifications in the invitation to bid that says, here's what you need to do to prepare your proposal to put in the envelope that's gonna be open. Um, that will be a description of their work, the insurance requirements. Uh, an important thing to note is that in California, again, for public works, 
you have to be registered with the DIR, the uh, Department of Industrial Relations. They govern the registration of all contractors and subcontractors. And more recently, uh, engineering and architectural firms as well. And they require prevailing wages where applicable. And that's monitored by uh, submitting certified payrolls. Why do I include this under a workshop on estimating? Because it has everything to do with your cost. I can assure you that if you start talking about a prime contract that is a, a million or bigger, the paperwork requirement becomes extremely uh, complex and cumbersome, and you need administrative infrastructure in place in your company in order to just keep up with it. So it is, it is, it does affect your cost of your estimate. If there's a project labor agreement, we'll talk about that in a little bit, but it essentially, mean, essentially means that every single worker that's working on site will be required to be union. Uh, there may be a minority disadvantage or small business, local hire, uh, disabled service veterans, any of those requirements, they will be called out and you need to uh, address them as they are applicable to how you prepare your price. The uh, specs, the specifications, the, doc the bidding documents will tell you how much time is allowed and the liquidated damages. Uh, another sidebar, how does that affect your bid? Well, if you're not aware of this already, if you've never did bid on public works, they don't always give you enough time, realistic time to bid the project and, and, and build the project. If in your mind, there is not enough time in the contract allowed to complete, then if I were you, I would put in some money for liquidated damages because if you don't finish on time and you don't have uh, justif justified reasons for this delay, you will not get a time extension and they can, they can start assessing liquidated damages on a dollar per day, dollars per day basis for every day that you finish late. And you might, I mean, maybe not, be surprised to learn that we contractors have long learned the seriousness of that clause. So putting money in for penalties that you might be assessed because you know you're gonna finish late is done all the time, folks. It's done all the time. Uh, there will be a type of critical path method schedule required, usually Microsoft Project or Primavera. Those are the two most dominant forms. There'll be submittals requirements, the number of copies, turnaround time, et cetera. Change order procedure, cost backup, markups, disputes. Uh, change orders can be, uh, I can do a four hour workshop on change orders and, and still barely scratch the surface. Uh, it is a myth out there that you can get rich on change orders. Only the largest general contractors with the muscle to uh, go toe to toe with an agency might make money on change orders. But the biggest reason that it's hard to make any money on change orders is that the markups are already dictated. That's right. You can't just expect that because you've gotten a change order, you can mark it up double or triple what you normally mark, what you marked up your original bid. Not going to happen. The, the markup for both the general and the sub is always specified in the contract, in the specifications, under general conditions, paragraph concerning change orders. Uh, there's a weather day allowance policy whereby they judge whether you are, uh, what constitutes a rain day and what constitutes a mud day 
and what doesn't uh, allow that. And it can get very complicated. There's a payout procedure and a retention policy. Retention is standard in California and it's standard at 5%. And that simply means that every monthly progress payment will have 5% be withheld from the prime contractor's payment. And so we general contractors will apply the same process to our subcontractors and your monthly payment will have 5% retained because the owner, will, <clears throat> the owner will not release that retention until we've satisfactory, satisfactorily completed the project with all in compliance with all contract terms. There'll be safety program requirements. We're in the COVID now. So that's become uh, an expense that you need to provide for it. It's what we call the SWPI, uh, stormwater pollution prevention control, uh, which erosion control. That's become standard in California. There's QAQC requirements and there's project closeout procedures. All of these issues must be accounted for in your spreadsheet. Here's a typical invitation to bid. This happens to be a large general engineering contractor that does out of Sacramento, California. They do a lot of Caltrans work. And I include this because it has some interesting uh, language. This goes out as an email. It goes out on the, uh, on the, on the trade newspapers. Uh, and hopefully all the subcontractors see it. And, uh, and respond accordingly. Okay, we are interested in seeking all qualified subs and suppliers, including DBEs. Quotes are needed for street sweeping, pollution, storm drainings, trucking, asphalt, precast concrete, etc. And they say we're willing to break up items into, into smaller increments to assist DBEs and small subs and suppliers obtaining work. Engineer's estimate happens to be 2.3 million on this particular job. And then they, they highlight this. Please note, this is a prevailing wage project. Well, it is automatically because it's a public agency. All subs will be required to enter our standard contract and must be union or willing to sign a one-time job agreement, which means you will be union for that project. 100% payment and performance bonds may be required of all subs. And notice they use word may. It is at their sole discretion. So for all of you subcontractors listening, if, if you're not bondable and you're bidding at a hundred, $150,000, $200,000 uh, subcontract, chances are they're not gonna use your number because they don't wanna take a chance on uh, hiring you, using you, and then having you unable to perform. Because whatever number you put in as your sub-bid proposal, that's what the general is going to enter on the spreadsheet. And that's all that's available for that item. And if you go belly up during the performance of the contract and they have to replace you with another sub, they're never going to get the, your scope of work finished for the balance of your contract at the same price. Never going to happen. It's always going to cost more. And that overage is all on the prime contractor. That's why most generals now have begun requiring, requiring payment and performance bonds from most subs. It depends on the size of the subcontract proposal. They want the scope letters by November 5th. Here's one from Kiwit, very large nation, well, international contractor. Same language, you'll get copies of all this. Highlighted here, if you'll be quoted as a sub or material supplier, 
and you're not familiar with our standard subcontract agreement, which we require our subcontractors and suppliers to execute, please the contractor office will send you a copy for your review. In actuality, nowadays, <coughs> pardon me, most primes post a copy of their standard subcontract on their website. And again, Kiwit requires that all subs and suppliers furnish a, perform a performance of payment bound. And they will pay the premium for it, but you need to make sure that, that uh, you tell them what that cost is so they can include add it to your price. Or if you, uh, that way they know to add it to your price. Let's see. Um, this is a sample of a scope letter content. Don't use this form as your scope letter. It needs to be on your letterhead. What I'm including, the reason I'm including it here, I, I'm showing, I'm illustrating all of the information items that should be on your scope letter. This is this form <clears throat> I'm talking to just you subcontractors. So the top part is the obvious uh, information items, name, address, contact person, are you union, non-union, are you bondable? If so, what rate, license number, your DIR number. Um, and then you can fill in the project name you're bidding on. And then you get to the meat of it. We will be quoting a price for the following work. Spec section number, general heading description, the specific scope. Are there any issues that the prime should be made aware of on lead time? Maybe the generator is a 12 week uh, uh, lead time. Uh, maybe the uh, HVAC units are nine months. Who knows? But the supply chain is being screwed up due to COVID. Uh, this becomes a big deal. Our price includes taxes, delivery, installed. And then down at the bottom, we have our exclusions and qualifications. Of course, you are, are allowed to exclude certain items. Uh, the items that you exclude need to be reasonable and, and applicable per your uh, trade classification. Uh, I'll come back to that in a moment. Let's keep on going. There is a sample electrical construction proposal. There's four bid items that they wanted that the prime need pricing on, exterior wiring and lighting, electrical, fire alarm system, security, and low voltage. Take a look at this. Under the word total, acknowledge receipt of addendas one, two, three, four, and five. Every project that is out to bid may or may not have an addenda. It's very rare to see a bid on the street anymore that does not have addendums. And those addendums are legitimate contractually binding modifications to the scope of work to the contract. So if, if, if an addendum is issued that affected this electrician, so let's say it was an addendum number four and he did not acknowledge this, then the prime contractor cannot trust that he's aware, he, uh, he must not be aware of addendum number four, which changed the panel size from 100 amp to 200 amp. And that affects the price for obvious reasons. So the bottom line is that acknowledging receipt of addenda is crucial and absolutely mandatory for any and all subcontract quotes. On bid day at our company, if we get a sub quote and we know that, and there's four addendums issued and I get a subcontractor quotation that acknowledges addendums one and two, can't use their number because in all probability, I don't even have time to call them on bid day. We're too busy assembling all the other pricing that's coming in the door. 
Here's a sample landscape bid. Lump sum, landscape and irrigation. Here's what they include. And they're saying, uh, we have noted the den of two through five. Uh, we confirm our quotation for plans and specs for the plans that were dated August 7th. They include plants and planting, amendments, mulch, irrigation, and maintenance. Here's their qualifications. These are work items, tasks that need to be addressed by the prime in order to make this landscape bid acceptable to the landscape contractor. The, the dirt's gotta be set at plus or minus the 10th of finished grade. Uh, they're not responsible for utilities. Bid to it valid for 60 days, straight time, no overtime, et cetera. They exclude power, uh, the irrigation and water meter and water service. And, any cutting, boring, coring, and patching, et cetera. So they've qualified their bid. And now if any of those items under exclusions and qualifications have a cost effect uh, associated with them, then I need to call that landscaper and say, well, what are we talking about here? And then I can, I can allow for it in my spreadsheet because what all, what, what, too often happens is that an item under a qualification or exclusion has a cost impact. And if I enter the landscaper's price and this item that we talk about is not uh, accounted for in my spreadsheet, I have a gap and I have a cost that I can't come back and argue with this uh, landscaper and say, well, you should have had this included. No, I don't. I have, I clearly exclude it. You don't want to, uh, you don't want to, uh, to uh, get in that situation. It happens more often than any of us care to uh, admit, but it, the, the reality is it does happen. Now, when it comes to labor costs, this is probably the most important spreadsheet that you'll learn in today's workshop. And this is an excellent format. I didn't devise it, I wish I had, but uh, I got it from a cost handbook years ago and we've used it for 40 years. And let me tell you, it absolutely works. And simply in, in an Excel format, you enter the hourly wage, up, which is their what they get on their paycheck. And then you apply the applicable payroll taxes and insurance, which are mandatory for the employer. Okay, we have to pay half of the social security tax. We have to pay the Medicare. We have to pay the unemployment. We have to, we have workers comp associated and our firm, we like to include the PLPD, property, uh, public liability and property damage. You can get over there. If you look at note three, the insurance rates in yellow are determined by the employer's insurance broker. And you can, you can quantify those in either in terms of percentage or dollars per hour, et cetera. But the reality is that you multiply percentages times the $25 and it kicks out the actual monetary value of those line items. The bottom ones are much easier because under California public contract road and the DIR, the fringe benefits are based on union fringe benefits and every trade has their own set of categories. I'm just using this as an example, health and welfare, which is what all of us call medical, pension, annuity trust, industry trend, vacation. So those are always given in terms of dollars or pennies. And you simply plug them in 
and kick them over to the straight time column. And when you add them all up, this $25 an hour person actually costs you $45.51. So I'm going to emphasize again, if you don't know what your people are truly costing you, all you have to do is plug this in. And let me tell you, if you're operating legitimately, not doing cash under the table, the first group are the same for every public, every legitimate business owner. And that applies not just to contractors, whether you're a restaurant owner, whether you are a dry cleaners owner, a sign company, whatever. Um, those are the costs that you're gonna have to address. And they will be there. If you're a contractor and you're doing a public works construction project, you will have union benefit categories with associated dollar values. So I think this is self-explanatory. You'll get a copy of it, but um, it's a sample. And if you happen to be open shop and you are bidding in the private sector and you are a small contractor and you pay no benefits, you have no 401k, you have no medical, you have no vacation, you have nothing. All you do is pay them 25 bucks an hour, then that's fine. They're still gonna cost you 25 plus the dollar 55 and the 36 and the 20 and the dollar and the 250 and the dollar. It's still gonna cost you over $31 an hour. So your, your cost is not $25 an hour. It's payroll taxes on top of that. And again, if you're a contractor on public works, you're gonna add these other ones. So the next batch, for example, here's a carpenter. And again, I'm emphasizing the word sample. The, um, the sample is showing clear three years ago, right? At that time, Carpenters were getting $42.52 an hour. The Social Security tax uh, was worth $264. The Medicare tax, $0.62. Cents. Workers comp, $468. PLPD, $244. Uh, under the union carpenter cost uh, benefits categories, health and welfare was $11.45 uh, an hour. That should have been over here, 11.45. Uh, pension is $10.10. Other costs are 2.59. Training is 93 cents and vacation 44. So the total cost per hour is um, total burden from payroll taxes and insurance down to uh, bridge benefits is another 40. That carpenter is costing us $83 an hour. So on my spreadsheet, when I est estimate my labor for let's say framing, every hour that I'm estimating that a carpenter is gonna be out there, that I have to plug in $83 an hour. This is crucial to understand what your people cost you. And when you start, Looking at, at, at the, the dollar value of these, these things hit $100 an hour without breaking a sweat. It's just extremely, extremely costly to be uh, bidding on public works in California. Here's another example. This one is for labor. Again, 2018. So don't go using this on your spreadsheet. And in three years ago, they're getting 30 and a half bucks an hour and their benefits were, were 30, almost $32 an hour. So laborers are, are costing us $62 an hour. This is for the basic category. This is for the poor old laborer that's down in the trench, digging with a shovel. I mean, that gives you some idea 
of why so many contractors can go belly up so quickly when you're incurring uh, costs like this. Let's go back to the carpenter for a moment. They're up close at in, today in 2021, we're approaching $90 an hour. Let's just use $90 an hour as a round number, an approximate. At $90 an hour cost, 40 times 90 is $3,600. So $3,600 a week is what a carpenter is costing. Multiply that times a four person crew and you're at $14,000 a week. I, I say this to emphasize how quickly we can, we can get out of control in losing track of uh, what labor costs could be. So now James, let's go back to the, uh, the regular slides, please. Ed, um, you were, we're battling for control of the mouse. Just don't, don't do anything right now. Okay. Right. All right, good to go. Very good. Uh, we do have a couple questions if you want to take a question break. Yeah, okay, let's do that. <clears throat> okay, where, so. Where are they, under our Q&A or chat? They're under the Q&A. Uh, do you want to just go ahead and take charge if you're done before? Yeah. Make sure to read them aloud. Yeah. Okay. Uh, from Anonymous. <laughs> if we add in the tax, is it based on the current sales tax? Absolutely. Are you adding tax to your own project or just your labor? No. Well, number one, we don't tax labor. We only tax materials and equipment. Um, and yes, you always uh, use the current sales tax rate. For, uh, for any purchase. What's the proper percentage of contingency per shot project? Good question. Um, when I teach estimating classes that are more in depth, I always, I always use the, this example. How much time and effort did you spend in preparing your estimate? In other words, how comfortable are you that you have a good bid, that you've got everything covered? If you spent a lot of time, you had a lot of subcontractor input, you've got good pricing, everything is accounted for on your spreadsheet, then your contingency should obviously be less. I hesitate to say a percentage. We use anywhere from one to 5% of the total bid, of the total, I'm sorry, the total cost. So, it just depends on how, how, much, how much time, how accurate you think your, your bid is. If you didn't have a lot of time, you threw this million dollar bid together in two days, uh, you're probably approximating and guessing on some items that you might want to increase your contingency. That's the best answer I can give you on that. Okay, so Francis, Francisco says, if there's an item that's excluded and ends up being a scope gap from the sub, though the GC includes that scope gap into the contract to the sub as part of their scope and it is executed, would that not fall back on the sub if they executed the contract? And you're absolutely right. Yes. That's why it's so important that you read a subcontract from a prime to see if they're description of scope matches your bid day proposal scope and that your exclusions and and qualifications are also covered because as soon as you sign that contract and something's missing it's yours so you are absolutely correct in your question uh, Drew, as an electrical distributor, most of this bidding process would not apply to us. Uh, correct? We would be simply be sending out quotes to the electrical subs. Uh, that's correct, Drew. Absolutely. You, uh, 
you, your, your obligation in sending out the quote to the electrical subs is, are you providing a, an equipment package, for example, controls or switch gear? Are you providing a quotation for material that meets and matches the specifications under the electrical specification section? It's very important. And if you are not, if you're bidding an alternate, then you need to let that electrician know because um, it may or may not be approval. It may not, may or may not be considered an or equal. So that that's your uh, important um, obligation that you have. It you are a supplier. So yes, your question is correct. Um, Leilani, does this apply to janitorial cleaning bids? Uh, yes, nowadays it does because um, if you're not aware of the construction unions really have a, uh, a stranglehold on public works construction and uh, janitors that are out there working on the cleanup at the end of the job, cleaning up the building, getting ready to turn it over to the owner, uh, you're going to have to pay prevailing wages, and they're going to they're going to question you. So <clears throat> it depends. Uh, it never hurts to uh, send that same question into the prime. Some primes like to uh, like to use a uh, a cleaning service, and they don't want you to have to deal with certified payroll. But that's becoming uh, a for a foregone conclusion nowadays that the union watchdogs are out there checking everybody that's on the site. And if they catch you with somebody who is not getting paid prevailing wage, um, it will, uh, it's gonna cost you. How do I handle vacation and work fee and payroll, Sandra Garcia? Uh, well, you have to track it. If the, on the vacation pay, you can pay it up front. Some, some companies pay it up front to, um, to the worker on their weekly paycheck. And what that means is that the, uh, when it comes time for them to take up time to take off, you don't have to pay them again because you've already paid them once. Uh, for our company, we bank the dollar value per hour for the vacation and we track it for them. Uh, under our accounting software. And then we have money to pay them depending on how many hours they've got banked. Uh, it, works, it works differently. Uh, I don't know what you mean when you say work fee. Um, I'm not familiar with that term. All right, that's all the questions. Let's keep going and then we'll have another Q and at the end. Okay, so in heavy civil construction, in that spec book, they will have a definition of a pay quantity. And by that, I mean, they will tell you uh, the price per cubic yard of, um, of curb and gutter per lineal foot. It includes rough grading, setting of the forms, pouring the concrete and finishing, stripping the forms, and applying curing compounds. That is the work that you have to cover in your unit price. Uh, determining your overhead costs is a function of knowing what it costs you to be in business. Uh, what is your uh, office rent cost? Uh, what are your license costs uh, as opposed to job site costs? Uh, we talked about determining labor and equipment costs. There's a unit pricing spreadsheet format I'm going to go into when we uh, open up the spreadsheet, quantity takeoffs and bundling and breakout of bid items. So let's go on next. Next, please. Okay, what do I mean by takeoff? I, I'm always a little surprised when I talk to uh, various classes that 
not everybody uh, knows what I mean when I say, what's a takeoff? <clears throat> a takeoff is a mathematical calculation of a quantity of material. And uh, when I ask you, as a, if you're a concrete sub, and I'll, I'll ask you the question, have you taken off the concrete? What I'm asking is, have you take, calculated all the quantities of cubic yardage of ready mix that you're going to buy and quantified it in, uh, in your spreadsheet? So what we, it's, it's called taking off, the lifting off by via of math calculation. Uh, determining how much lumber is in the building, how much, how many squares of roofing material there are, how many windows are there, how many doors are there, et cetera. So there's, uh, there's two ways to take off material. The old fashioned way, mathematics, you measure, count, read, and calculate. And we're not talking trigonometry, we're just simply talking simple addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division. And of course, we're in the 21st century software. Bluebeam is a uh, software program that literally you can take your mouse and click on the four corners of the floor plan and it will calculate automatically the square footage in that building. Um, that's great, that's great. I see it as a crutch because if you can do basic math take off of quantities on your drawings, uh, you can, you're gonna get in trouble. Sooner or later, you will get in trouble and you start depending on artificial means to determine this. But <clears throat> then again, I'm a dinosaur. So who's, who, who cares what Ed says? A uh, heavy bid is another estimating program that the big boys use and they have methods of calculating dirt work, asphalt, um, cement treated base, et cetera, the, the items and quantities that go into uh, a highway or a, or a bridge or a, those types of larger structures. Next, please. <coughs> Pardon me. This, this example shows a good way to roll up an intermittent, an intermittent cost. And I'll use a carpenter's as example. So let's say we need a framing crew and that framing crew is gonna consist of a foreman, two journeymen, one apprentice and two laborers. So, and, I, and I'm gonna, in my spreadsheet, I'm gonna enter the category rough carpentry slash frame building. And in that, in order not to do every single two by four and every two by six and every four by six header and every trust joist, et cetera, <clears throat> I simply say, I'm going to have these five people out there for six weeks to frame this um, 4,000 square foot building. So it's much easier if I do it on a cost per hour crew basis. So you simply enter in the carpenter cost, a foreman at 90, two journeymen at 85 each, an apprentice at 50 and a laborers at 65. You extend that out, add it up. So my total cost per hour for the framing crew is $440 an hour for a 40 hour week. Multiply times 40, and it's 17 grand a week. Or one day cost is 3,520 bucks per day. <clears throat> when I enter the framing labor item, I simply say crew, crew hours or crew week, a quantity of six at 17,600 a week. I multiply six times 17, uh, six, and I get, um, well, what is six times 17? Uh, over $100,000. That is my labor cost. 
So it doesn't take a rocket scientist to see the impact of the importance of good management and good estimating. If my competitors can frame that building in three weeks, I'm $35,000 overpriced. If my estimator is not aware of our productivity rate and we seriously underestimate and it's really an eight week job, we're gonna take a hit of 17 grand a week for every week that we're over. Or more specifically, for every day that we go over the, the four weeks that we had planned, it's $3,500 a day. You can eat, hit, uh, impact your bottom line very quickly when you have large crews on a public works contract. And, and mind you, this is just labor costs. I'm not talking about the cost impact of um, equipment rentals that take too long or equipment that doesn't show up and the crew standing around with their thumb up their nose. Uh, this is where your estimating ability is put to the test and then it's transferred over to the field for your project and job site supervision and management uh, is, must be held accountable. Next. So what you want to do is that you develop standard estimating checklists and forms. Make your forms consistent with the way you will record job costs. Always debrief on successful and unsuccessful bids. What did we do right? What did we do wrong? How come we got this job? Uh, why didn't we get this job? And maintain files on those. Next. Now. Let's go back one click, James. Let's go over to the uh, spreadsheet, James. All right, go for it. All right. Yeah, I've got it. Thank you. All right, everybody. Here is a basic spreadsheet, and it's, it's a model that we've been using for. As I said, 35 years. And it works for us. If you want to do something different, that's the beauty of Excel. You set it up differently. But we, this is battle proven, if you will. And it works because it's simple. Okay. When I say set up your, your bid sheet as a, as a to do list, that means every single line item has to have a purpose and a cost. So under what we prime contractors call general conditions, job site overhead, which is another general conditions is another name for job site overhead. This example I'm, I'm, I'm showing you on the screen right now is as per a general contractor, the prime. So you subs just listen for the moment and we'll, we'll come back to you. But for you primes, these are costs that you absolutely will incur during the course of a project. And the larger the project, the more costly these items are. General conditions, i.e. Uh, Job site supervision is not part of overhead. This is a job cost. So the categories are task description, a work unit, which will be WK week, month, lump sum, each, hour, et cetera. The second column, column D is unit cost, 1,500 a week for a superintendent. 
a survey engineer, I have a quote, a lump sum, a quantity of one for $3,500. Job site equipment, I've got a backhoe and a JLG. I want, I want, I want them on one month, on the site for one month, the $3,500 cost. Right. Going back up to superintendent, the job's four months long, so for 12 weeks, I enter the number 12. There's a formula already inserted in there. If you look up in the top, the toolbar E4 times D4, and it kicks it out at $18,000. These are all as applied. So you have a vehicle allowance at 500 a month. Should have put gasoline in here, so shouldn't I? Especially at $5 a gallon here in California. Normally I would. I, I abbreviated some of these task items in order to keep the uh, example simple. But I would always include a, that's the cost of the, what is a, uh, a pickup cost, cost us? 500 a month is a reasonable number. And um, nowadays, oh, our gasoline costs can run $500 a month as well. Project manager as applicable, uh, tolls and parking fees, um, telephone service. We have, everybody's got a cell phone out there. A job site uh, structures, a chemical toilet, a job shack and a walk-in box, right? Well, I can get those from a rental company for 500 a month, and I'm gonna be out there for two months or three months. Um, so there's $1,000 for that and so forth. All right, I have a con contingency here that I just picked an arbitrary number. I put, I put $7,500 in there. All right, so what do these represent? These represent the cost that the prime contractor is gonna incur without pouring one single yard of concrete, pounding one nail, or putting up any steel. In other words, it's job site overhead. It's gonna cost me this amount during the course of this 12 week job to do this. And that number is $51,650. Just for your information, uh, when you start hitting a couple of million, two, three, four, five million dollar bids, the general conditions can run as much as uh, a couple of hundred thousand dollars easily. And you haven't done a lick of work. Now, sticking with the unit price format that Caltrans and other uh, county road jobs, they'll have those, remember, you remember that example I showed you of the bid items. So I set up a little mini spreadsheet that accounts for those items. So I, bid item number one was MOVE and DEMO. Bid item number two was hot mix asphalt. Bid item number three is structure backfill. And I have a subtotal here that I'm gonna I'll come back to. I have concrete sidewalk bid item four, and I have electrical light bulb. An arbitrary selection of a little miniature spreadsheet, if you will, of five bid items. Okay, here's where we get into the actual bidding, uh, setting up of the spreadsheet. So again, the same categories, let me, let me go back up to the top. You have the unit costs, you have your takeoff quantity, you have your in-house labor as category, and the formulas will kick out totals in this column as applicable. We have materials and equipment, where it's materials and equipment. And then we have subcontracts. That, these columns apply to all the way down the line. So under MOVE and DMOVE, it's all me. It's 15,000 in and 15,000 out. So my subtotal of direct cost is $30,000. If I go to asphalt, now, now you subcontractors can listen in. This, this is how any of us account for what it costs us to build a project. 
So let's say this is my paving subcontractor. All right, their typical to-do list could be the following. Purchase the asphalt, trucking cost, the asphalt crew, the rollers and the asphalt machine, the operators, and the cleanup labor. Now it can be a lot more complicated than that. It can be as simple as that. It's whatever you as a subcontractor feel you need to describe here to cover the assembly and the completion of the work and account for all the costs. So obviously this category of hot asphalt can be larger, you know, it's never gonna be smaller than what I'm showing, but it can certainly be larger. And again, per ton, per load, per crew hour, per hour, per crew hour, per hour, lump sum, lump sum. So the asphalt under, under the uh, takeoff quantity, which is E, The estimated quantity is 125 tons. Now, we're gonna buy that from the granite batch plant and they're quoting us a price of $65 an hour, $65 a ton tax included. And we pick it up at the plant. So my trucking costs, my tr I get a quote from my trucker and they're gonna quote me a hundred loads, a uh, hundred dollars a load. And I know there's 10 loads, 12 and a half tons each. And so my trucking costs are $1,000. My asphalt crew utilizing that crew hour methodology is $220 an hour. So given that it's only 10 tons, they're gonna lay this down in a day, so eight hours. I have the roller and the asphalt machine are gonna cost me $150 an hour each. I'm just using that as a number, and they're going to be out there for the day. Uh, same thing with the operators, two of them, and a laborer. So that's how we arrive at the cost for 125 tons of asphalt is $15,000. Under structure backfill, same principle, same process. Loader rental, loader operator, purchased clean backfill material, place and compact, some whackers and vibratory plate, install the sub drain, sub drain material, and a water truck. Same principle that I just went through on the asphalt, and I come up with $10,990. I'm showing this little short example on the bottom to show how you could, if you were bidding one item for you as a as a, as a sub, you can put your profit and overhead at 25% or 30% or whatever, whatever you want. And there's your bid. So there's my, there's my, uh, uh, there's my cost that I want. I'm gonna be paid 13 grand to do the structure back. Well, concrete sidewalk, we cut, excavate, and find grade. We set the forms. We buy the drain rock. We install the drain rock. We buy the rebar. We install the rebar. We purchase the concrete. We place and finish, and we strip and cure. Same thing, $22,000. Electrical. The electrician buys the poles, installs the poles, drills the pier holes, pours the piers, and dry pack the base. 16 grand. All right, so using these very five simple examples. We have now assembled, uh, going back to the prime position, I've now assembled, I think, everything involved in this little project. Now I need to roll it up because everything here, all of these costs have been entered at cost. Haven't marked up a thing. So I do a recap on the other tab and I recreate and this mimics the bid form. But let me qualify that statement. 
It mimics the bid proposal form that we showed in the very first PDF attachment that I utilized. But, I'm, but it, it mimic is only over here. Hang on, hang on a second. Let me reduce this in there. Okay, so this is what is shown on the bid proposal form for me as the prime contractor. A unit price and an as bid extension. Actually, it's this, I'm sorry, it's these two. So what, I, what have I done here? Well, on my spreadsheet, I've, I've entered formulas to go back over to the estimate and pick up the 51, the 30, the 15,000, et cetera. And, and, and it pulls them and enters them here, 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 item four, item five. Now, there is no bid item and there never will be for general conditions slash job site overhead. They expect you to distribute that cost of the general conditions into the defined bid items. So I've got to, I've got to allocate them. And because they are the costs that they are, I've got $51,000 I've got to account for. So under something simple like MOB and DMOB, I'm going to put just 4% of that. So in this call in the in column E under GC cost, I took four percent of the fifty one six fifty and allocated two thousand sixty six dollars. And then on the big items, the actual work items, roadway, asphalt, structure, backfill, sidewalk, electric light poles, I put in twenty four percent each. These are arbitrary allocations, folks. You can, you, can, you can distribute these any way you want, as long as you come up with 100% and you picked up that $51,000 because it's a real cost, remember? It's not gonna be in your markup. So now I have $2,000 of GC costs in my MOB and DMOB, and I have 12 grand in the other four each. So now my total costs are these numbers or a subtotal of 147. And here's where I, I pick my number. What do I want to bid it at? Do I want it 15, 20, 30, 40, 50%? <clears throat> That's a number that I can't tell you to, what to bid. You do it. Let me give you one hint for you prime contractors. If your bid is prime on a heavy civil project, um, <laughs> bear in mind, you're not going to make the same percentage markup that subcontractors make. So the good news is for you subs, you can mark up. I've seen markups as high as 40% on subcontractor costs. And it flies. It, it, it's competitive. It, it's, it's market competitive. If I put 40% on a job, I'll never get a job as a prime contractor, never. So I'm just using this as an example. So we put 15% on each item. And there's the markups there. Subtotal again. Now the final thing I have to do as a prime is that I have to bond the job. So that bond cost has got to be included in my number. So if my bonding rate's two and a half percent, there's my bond cost, or the $4,229 is what I'm going to be paying my broker for the cost of the performance of payment bonds that I'm going to issue to Caltrans when I'm awarded the contract. And I don't pay that, by the way, unless I do get the job. 
you don't pay for bonds unless you get the contract. So now I'm at 173, 381. So if we stopped right there, <clears throat> that's, and it was a lump sum bid, that's what I would be doing, but it's not a lump sum bid. It's got a pay quantity of two for MOVE and DMOVE, a pay quantity of 125, a pay quantity of 600, a pay quantity of 4,000 square feet and six each. So simply taking this total cost of this bid item, dividing it by two, I come up with 18,899 and divide 32,582 by 125. And the formula is, you look up on the toolbar, it's K7 divided by L7, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So now I have what we call theoretical exact spreadsheet calculation unit price. Well, another thing that you should be aware of is that you have a bid runner sitting over there in the, um, well, they used to be in uh, Sacramento or in the office of the county road commissioner where, where the um, bids are being received and, and your bid runner is filling these numbers in because you're still taking sub quotes and supplier quotes right up to the last minute. So we try to simplify it and we round up or round down and we've created a, a column that's called the as bid. And this is what my bid runner is gonna fill in. And I, we do that for two reasons, to make it easier to fill out the bid and second, to make calculations a, a, you know, a, little, a little easier. So the as bid becomes 18,900, the uh, round down a dollar to the uh, asphalt at 260 a ton, $46 a yard, $10.25 a square foot or 5,700 each and then this pay quantity times my as, as bid unit price, and I come up with my as bid extension, and I come up with 173.1, and I, I, I compare that total to my theoretical exact total. They need to be very close because I have rounded up and rounded down on column M unit price. Remember, this was this is what the spreadsheet kicked out. It's exact. I could go with that, except these numbers over here would become a little unwieldy. So that's why we do the as bit. And and literally every general contractor does this. So I wind up with 173.1, 1, 173.381. Close enough. My bid is what I'm going to turn in is I'm going to turn in these five numbers. I'm going to turn in these two columns. And my total at the bottom is going to be 1731. So I have rolled up these costs. And emphasizing again, these costs here in, in, in uh, the, to do the tasks, here is where you expand it to whatever fits your work. <clears throat> now, a last caution. Because of this nature of the multi, of this requirement for multi-bid items, <clears throat> pardon me, um, the engineers who are preparing the bid form and, and preparing the drawings, they like to arrive at their estimate and they arrive at their estimate, their engineer's estimate by virtue of quantities and past records of bids. So they, you know, Caltrans bids hundreds and hundreds of miles of freeway and road work a year. 
and they're all in this format. So they know what, what the range is for hot mix asphalt. They know what the range is for structure backflow. And so if they do their takeoff estimated quantity, they do that times their average price under the last 10 bids for 2020. And that gives them their estimate. And that's how they arrive at their budget numbers. They don't necessarily have to be correct. They're approximations. They are exactly what they say, an engineer's estimate. It's not finite. So that's an overview of how this process works. Um, I think the emphasis that I, that I wanna place is number one, you, you really should be using a spreadsheet to put your numbers together. It does not have to be as detailed as this if you're a subcontractor. And as you're, if you're a subcontractor, everything here is already paid for by the prime contractor. It's covered in it. You're not going to be responsible for it. You don't provide a chemical toilet on the job. You don't provide a dumpster on the job. Uh, you don't do the permits. Etc. But you will have certain amount of costs. If it's a big building job and you're an HVAC uh, or a plumbing con subcontractor, chances are you need a job trailer and maybe even a little, short, a little small job office. As soon as you start hitting ten million dollar buildings, uh, the MEP, Mechanical Electrical Plumbing Subcontractors they will have job shacks and possibly even their own toilets because they have such a large amount of work as a subcontractor. So you will have a certain amount of general conditions, but if you're under $10 million for the prime contract, the chances are that the subcontractors job site overhead is usually limited to superintendent slash foreman pick up gasoline and maybe a walk-in box. Uh, you'll have tolls and parking fees though. Uh, you will have the safety program because you're gonna have to participate in it. And I as a prime am not paying you to pay your people to attend the safety program. That's on you. Uh, you are gonna have a tool expense. You are gonna have a telephone expense. So I'm gonna modify my statement. You're gonna have some of these costs as a subcontractor. It just depends on the size of your operation for this particular bid that you are assembling. Uh, okay, so let's go back to uh, Q&A and uh, let's see if we have some more questions. All right, we do have a couple of questions in there, Ed. You want to take them away or uh, otherwise I can help? Okay, Omid Nabil, what is your, <laughs> what's your consultation and advice as an expert? Well, I don't know that I'm an expert. I'm, I'm battle proven, I think. <laughs> For a new established general that has never participated in the public project. You need to listen to everything I'm telling you and you need to be familiar with what's going to be required. Uh, in particular, if you're going to bid as a prime on a public works project, all of these things that I've talked about in the early slides are going to apply. For example, under the labor, you will be paying, uh, even if you're a non-union general, you will be paying your people union scale because the DIR's definition of prevailing wage is nothing more than a rubber stamp of the local union contract. So don't think that you're going to be saving money or being uh, getting a cost advantage by paying your carpenters $30 an hour and no benefits. Never going to happen. You are going to have the same hourly costs 
that I have or any other union contractor. Number two, if you are not familiar with the bonding process, um, you better get familiar with it because you will not be bidding any jobs as a prime unless you are bondable. Every job over $25,000 for a prime construction, construction contract, public works agency, it must be bonded by the prime. Okay, my good friend Janelle, uh, prices of electrical supplies have more than double. How do you make adjustments in a bid you've already given? Would you submit a change order? Um, no. Uh, it's, a it's, a, it's, a, it's a process that uh, destroys uh, so many contractors, subcontractors. They think, well, the price of lumber went up, so. Uh, uh, I, I, I get a change order. Not in public works. If you can get on a, on a private job, I'd be surprised. But in a public job, absolutely no increases or increase in costs. If it takes you longer to bid it, your labor budget isn't enough, it's just too bad. So um, the only way that you can even come close to protecting yourself is in your sub bid proposal on your scope letter on before bid day, you have an exclusion. You say, our prices are good for 30 days after which we expect a price increase. And my, question, my response to you is gonna be, how much are you expecting? Because you need to put that how much in there. Well, I don't know what it's gonna be. Well, you better guess. Because if, if I get the job and I give you a subcontract, you need to know that you're not gonna get a change order for an increase in cost of materials. It sounds harsh, but that's the real world. On a new bid, what's a good way to, to account for a percentage and still have a reasonable bid, bid? Well, what we do is we call up our supplier. I, I call the lumber yard and I said, Okay, I know it's going up, but what do you expect is gonna go up in the next 90 days? I don't know, Ed. Um, we hope it's gonna be under 5%. Well, I'll probably put three and a half, four percent 4% on my lumber materials, expect an increase. And if I hit at three and a half, four percent 4%, great. If it more than three or 4%, I'm gonna to have to eat it. And if it comes in less, well, I just got a little bonus because I don't have to give anything back. You don't, you don't expose the breakdown on your costs to any public works owner on bid day. You simply give them a number. Okay, uh, the next question is from Anonymous. I have found that our bid item lists are never the same. We are constantly revising our bid sheets because our usual bid item list changes. Sometimes it's lump sum and eventually they want a scope cost breakdown to pay. Sometimes they separate pieces into a couple of items. <laughs> um, are you talking about, I, I think I, 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 well, under the bid form, the proposal form that the prime is submitting yeah, that they're, they're, they're never going to be the same. Never. They're always, each job is going to be unique unto its own. So you have to adjust your, your spreadsheet. That's why you need to make a template. And you, then you do a file save as and label it this new job. And then go in and edit it and make it match. Because every one of them is different. And the biggest mistake that a lot of subs do is pick up an old bid for template and utilize it verbatim. And that's, that's really, really dangerous. Um, there is no tip or trick. Whatever um, the lump sum that they want broken down, that will only occur if you wind up getting the job on a, on a, on a public works project. They're going to want. They're going to want a uh, 
a cost breakdown. Uh, you, you don't tell me what kind of work you do, so I don't know if you're a sub or a prime. But if you're a prime under the unit price method, uh, that bid form is the payout form. That's how you get paid off that bidding form. Do you recommend any books on bidding? Uh, yeah, Sweets uh, has a uh, uh, estimating handbook that's pretty handy for a guideline. And I emphasize guideline. No one is an expert on your costs like you yourself. So I would, we have uh, cost handbooks in our office and we use them all the time for uh, reference of material. But ultimately, the cost entry into that spreadsheet is best based on our best uh, input on whether it's current, uh, whether it's um, accurate, and based on our productivity. And Giovanna says, would you are able to customize? Yeah, that's the beauty of Excel. You, 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 you want to do that. You want to take my basic template that I showed you. You want to take that and customize it to match your, the way you like to bid a job. The estimate needs to be uh, personal, personally user friendly. And you want to make it that the, the thing it must contain though is the format breakdown on those columns of of unit price and the, the extension and the categories that format needs to be you, you should follow that as a guideline but over in the first column under tasks you enter the tasks that you feel help you arrive at a description of what it's going to take to build the job are there standard forms that we need to use? And if so, where do we acquire them from? Well, it, again, A, if you're a subcontractor, the standard form is the scope letter because I, I, <clears throat> I will take your bid. Hang on. I will take your bid, uh, your scope letter as your, as your form. And then I'm gonna send you my subcontract. I'm not gonna sign your proposal. I'm not gonna sign your bid, bid proposal form. I'm not gonna sign your contract. <clears throat> you're gonna sign mine. But as far as forms are concerned, if you're a prime contractor, uh, the only form that you need to fill out is the one that's provided by the owner. Um, as far as purchasing contracts, I, I always recommend that you use um, a uh, purchase agreement as opposed to a purchase form. I'll cover forms in more detail on Thursday. Uh, yes, these um, are Janelle's question. Uh, all of this will be available. Uh, I don't know if about tomorrow. I'm sure James will make it available very quickly. I may very well get it up this afternoon, but um, at the latest tomorrow midday. Um, and and we're, we're including the Excel spreadsheet as well, right, Ed? Right. All right, great. Any other questions? Okay, so we answered 13 of them. That's good. Nice, yeah. Good audience, thanks everyone. Uh, yeah. I would like to talk a little bit about, let's let me just take the here. Thanks Gloria, she says amazing class. Um, I just wanna talk about some of our upcoming events. Most relevantly, we have a uh, public works web series number two, the second part. This is on estimating and bidding best practices. And this is coming up tomorrow, uh, sorry, not tomorrow, Thursday. And uh, our registration for that is significantly lower for the, than for this one. so. We do hope you will take a look um, at that one and see if you're interested in registering. Like all of them, they're all free to join, easy to join. 
And then um, our partners in Caltrans are holding a couple of events that we're participating on in August 17th and the 19th, finding Caltrans and state government contracting opportunities and finding federal government contracting opportunities. And then finally, we are hosting a webinar in partnership with the County of Santa Clara on requests for proposals. And that is on August 26th at 10 a.m. So do take a look at those on our website. Um, as I said, they're free to join just like this one is. Um, we're getting thanks coming into the chat. Thank you so much everyone for joining. And just a reminder that we have been recording. So you're gonna get the video and you're gonna get the slides. And um, uh, when you leave this session, you'll be directed towards a, uh, a survey. If you could just let us know how you felt that we did today. Um, uh, it means a lot to us if we just get some, some feedback on this. It means a lot to our funder and it helps us keep keep our services uh, fresh and uh, high quality. So I'll also put the survey in the chat right here um, and just wanna thank everyone once again and hope to see you at future webinars. Uh, and again, take a look at that survey and thanks Ed for putting in all the work and the research for doing this, so. Well, thank you James for your help and uh, thank you everybody. I hope this was uh, helpful and uh, applicable to your, to your particular company operation. I can be reached a uh, real simple website, uh, email address, ed at norcalptac.org. And um, hope to see uh, most of you on, or all of you on Thursday. And we do appreciate the feedback. All right. Thanks. Have a good day, everyone. Bye-bye.